Hello and welcome to the Humans and Vent Cycling Podcast. My name is Richard Moore. Tonight in Florence, after the Men's World Road Race Championship, I'm joined by Daniel Freib. Good evening. Buonasera. And this is tremendously exciting for, for everybody. But we are rejoined by Ciro Scognamilio. Ciro, Ciro. Of Gazetta della Sport. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Dear listeners, I'm here for you. I'm ready. Only for you. Ciro, it's wonderful to have you back. How have you been? When? Um, since, the, since the last time we had you on the podcast. So after the Tour de France, yeah. you mean? Yeah. Well, just some holidays, mm-hmm. some fun. Where? Where, Ciro? Beach. Well, in Naples, beach. Beach. He doesn't like mountains. Exactly. And so you can imagine how it's difficult to my work in cycling. Yeah. Because the cycling Takes you into is mountains. full of mountains. Too much, yeah. <laughs> Too much in my opinion. In my opinion, we could speak about... More this beach po- racing. Exactly. Maybe we could uh, speak about this on another podcast. Yeah, okay. Special we, we, we have got a race to talk about. Exactly. We have a race. You are very shorn again. Your hair, you've had a great haircut again. Like yeah. in, uh, where was that, Lyon, where you joined us having been yes. to the barber. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I joined the barber here Making in Monte Very, very yeah. streamlined. You're listening to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast, powered by Sharp. Giro, the race. Uh, Vincenzo Nibali, your man, he was fourth. We thought for a while, when he attacked on the final lap and took away Rodriguez, it looked as though Nibali was having crashed earlier and got back on. Yeah. Remarkable. Remarkable yeah. scenes. In my opinion, a remarkable race from mm. uh, Vincenzo Nibali. I mean, uh, his season has been very long. Mm. And uh, in these words, for example, look at the other winners of the Grand Tour, Froome and Horner. They disappeared after a few laps, mm-hmm. maybe also a little bit uh, before the, cir- the start of the circuit of Florence. Mm. I mean, uh, certainly for anybody, the fourth place maybe is the worst place, but in my opinion, he did a great race, a especially, great race. especially if we consider the crash. He fell heavily. I was reminded of the Giro in, in the rain where he crashed in the rain in the Giro and he was straight back up and he didn't seem to be affected by it. But today, hmm? his confidence seemed to go. Yeah, I, I had the same impression. Did you speak to him after the race? Yeah, yeah, and he said that. He confirmed that. Also, Paolo Bettini said that. I mean, mm-hmm. the, psychologically, it was not so ready as usual in the descent. And mm-hmm. also, this could have been a factor. He was down for a long time and uh, very strange to see the Italian favourite in the World Championship in Italy getting back to, into the bunch. Did he get some help, do you think? The um, uh, Belgian journalists in the press room were not impressed with that. <laughs> not impressed. Because they are used to, maybe. <laughs> the Belgians? Yeah. Oh. I remember. It's normal. It's normal. It's it's normal. normal. I, I mean, he'd normal. crashed heavily. Yeah, yeah. 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 In my opinion, it's normal. The mechanic was just adjusting his brake box. Exactly. But, you know, we, Richard and I were saying it felt like a very retro world championship because... It was in it, it, old fashioned. It was it, we were in Italy. Italy were dominating again, as though they were the number one nation in the world. You know, two Spanish guys contending the victory there, yeah. contending for the victory. Even was, a few, quite a few Frenchmen up there yeah, as well in, felt, in the final. Whereas the, the new world, the new world, disappeared America, without Great sink, Britain, without trace. Yeah. Yeah, Australia, it's it's Simon fact. Clark, good race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's interesting. Mm. Uh, I, I must confess, till now, I didn't. <sighs> think about this aspect, but it's true, it's an aspect of these words. I mean, the new cycling disappeared. Maybe because it's also possible that the new cycling, as uh, Australia, Great Britain, maybe when races are complicated by natural factors mm. or something strange... Something unpredictable. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe their strategy yeah. fault. Something like that. Because they do race to a plan, don't they? Yeah. Exactly. Mm. When they when they, their plan work, okay, it's okay. But if there are some other factors, maybe they mm. they don't work it in the same way. When you spoke to Nibali afterwards, was he disappointed? Yes, he was disappointed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because I mean, <coughs> the real goal of the second part of his season was this World Championship, more than mm-hmm. World. I mean. Because, uh, yeah, 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 I said that. Uh, also because, uh, I mean, certainly, normally, next year, he will have other opportunities to win a Grand Tour. Mm-hmm. Um, but a World Championship, I mean, it was a tough race in Italy, in mm-hmm. Florence, you know, not, now he lives in Switzerland, but he spent a lot of time in Tuscany. I mean, maybe it was a unique occasion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ciro, how do you think um, Italy has reacted to this world? I mean, um, it's... 
cycling is, doesn't have the same profile that it used to have in Italy. But how, how do you think this week the Italians have, have kind of embraced the World Championships in Florence? I mean, um, I mean, comparing with last years, because uh, the last time that uh, Italy won a uh, medal in the World was uh, five years ago mm. in Paris. So five years without medals, it's a well, lot they were for first it. and second, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, first yeah. and second yeah. and fourth, yeah. And uh, I know for, for Italy, it's a lot of time. Mm. I mean, in this case, I have the impression, also my colleagues, I spoke a little bit with them that, uh, I mean, Italy, I mean, certainly a little, was a little bit unlucky with all this crash, also Paolini and something like that. I mean, they way, they race has been better than last year's. I have this impression. But in Italy now, there is a great point um, of interrogation, a mark point. Paolo Bettini will remain coach of Italian national team or not? This is the question mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. But uh, he doesn't seem to want to, particularly. Earlier this year, he didn't seem to want to. I mean, this is the impression, but I'm not convinced that it's so that it's so true. But what about the Italian public? How have they reacted to this week? What have TV viewing figures been like? What were the crowd? What do you think the crowds were like in Florence? Good or I mean, today obviously the weather was uh, a, a problem. Uh, exactly. D- d- difficult to say. Maybe expect also a little bit more. But cycling in Italy now has not a relevant place. Uh, in the interest... Well, the, ma- the major figure has been Gino Bartoli. You know, if you walk around Florence... And he didn't even ride today. The major <laughs> figure, <laughs> exactly. the dominant figure of these world championships in Florence has been Gino Bartoli. And maybe that, that, maybe that tells us a lot about Italian yeah, cycling exactly. culture. Exactly. I agree completely. And the problem is that Italy has only one really strong rider, top rider, is Vincenzo. Mm-hmm. But Vincenzo Nibali is not a real, uh, I don't know the word in English, it's not... Uh, I mean, he's not he's the not charismatic. A, yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. I must say, it was wonderful being at the finish, watching the race, and even when Visconti made an earlier move, yeah. the, the reaction from the crowd was, was brilliant. It was like being in a football crowd. Yeah. It was well, like being in well, a football crowd. The thing that I noticed um, is that that reaction comes from men over 50, generally speaking. You know, where, yeah, the, yeah, the people so. that that I saw getting very, very excited about the race. Mm, one, mean, or, one or two younger, perhaps? Maybe. What about the race? Rui Costa won, let's not forget him. What were your feelings about how the... I mean, the race was... It was a war of attrition. The, the weather was a dominant factor. The group was much bigger, I think, than we expect, expected with about a lap to go. Still about 50 riders, wasn't it, with about a lap to go? Yeah. Uh, nothing really happened, and, and we were all waiting, I think, for Sagan or Cancellara to make a move. On the final lap, that didn't happen. It was Nibali who really ignited it. And it was a, a very calculated performance by Rui Costa. He, he, he measured it just right, didn't he? And, uh, yeah, and the next year it will be in an Italian In Lamprey. Yeah. They've had a lot of world champions. We were just talking yeah, about that. Einstein's, yeah, Einstein's, yeah, 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 it's not the first time. Yeah, 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 it's the first time. All a little bit and underdog. Little bit, and a little bit controversial. Yeah, yes, I mean, it's, it also, also, yes, for sure. Also in the past... Mm. Because there are things that are not extremely clear, but yeah. He served a, a band, didn't yeah. he? Uh, two yeah. of the four uh, in the in the final move, you know, Valverde and Rui Costa, both have a doping uh, history, uh, yeah. I suppose you could say. Chico, um, what did you re- what did you make of um, the Spanish tactics at the end? The, do you think so? It reminded me a lot of World Championships where uh, Mape riders <laughs> were present. Yeah. And there was always, a, in Italy, particularly months of debate afterwards, had the Mape riders been um, tied to their, you know, their trade team alliance, or had they been uh, I mean, loyal not, to them? Yeah, not a good tactic from Spain. I mean, two men as Rodriguez and Valverde in the main bunch out of four, and then certainly second and third are two medals, but those awards like that, I mean... I was really impressed uh, by the words of Pulito Rodriguez after the race. Mm-hmm. He said, he certainly was climbing, and he said, well, so in this way, I, he won a lot of races in his career, Fritz Barlone, also Giro di Lombardia, but he said, I will be remembered as the man of the great defeat, I mean, Giro, Vuelta, and now the words. I mean, he, he, he was really oh, sad. And also, man, I, yeah. I was sad for him. Mm. I, I must it, was, it was one of the more sort of tantalizing defeats in a world championship, was it? When you think of how close he, he got on his own. It was and this was the first road race of the week that has uh, not ended with a single, a solo rider yeah. winning. Mm. Um, you know, it almost did. It almost did. I mean, Rodriguez went away twice 
and clearly that was the Spanish plan. But why did Valverde not follow Rui Costa? I suppose that's a big question. Well, this is a big question. And he didn't really answer it very satisfactorily. In the what, press what were your impressions of the press conference? Well, the, I mean, the, the, obvious, the very obvious thing was the, the body language between the two was very frosty. They were, so the, there were three seats behind the stage on the press conference. And um, the, the middle seat was left empty for Rui Costa, who hadn't arrived at that point. So they were physically separated by a few metres, um, Rodriguez and Valverde, but Val Rodriguez didn't turn to face Valverde at any point in the press conference, whereas Valverde was constantly glancing across at Rodriguez while he was answering, almost as if to, to look for some sign of reassurance that Rodriguez wasn't too angry with him. Or... It's really serious, this podcast. Yeah, it is, isn't it? We're going to have to too lighten much? it up. We're going to have to lighten up. Oh, I was wondering. What, 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 what kind of levity customs. can you bring? What levity can you bring? Well, I mean, our customs in Tour de France were so, well, yeah, yeah. a little bit different. We're going to lighten up in the next part. Ah, okay. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. Okay, Chiro, tell us a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, was, I was still thinking about my proposal at the end uh, at, at the end, sorry, at the beginning of this podcast, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my proposal to organize a single podcast, also lo a long podcast, about my proposal to organize a stage race, 20 stages near the beaches, <laughs> only one stage, mountain. one mountain stage. <laughs> this is my dream in cycling. Uh, <laughs> it's a brilliant Listeners, idea. what do you think to, about that? To the plage. Well, Chiro works for La Gazzetta dello Sport, yeah. which is the same organisation as RCS yeah. Sport, yeah. who next year are organising the Tour of Dubai. Are you ah. involved? Are you behind Are this? you the brains behind? But the problem is that Tour of Dubai is only four days. Mm. <laughs> Not enough time I in want the beach. a grand tour. I, I want to be clear. Dear, dear listener, I wish you could see uh, Chiro's hand movements. Because uh, I, have the duty, his because I, I have the duty to be really serious and really clear. Yeah. I have this duty with our listeners. Mm -hmm. and so I want to be clear. I want a grand tour. A grand tour a of grand the beach. A grand tour like that. Of Not a beaches. tour of Oman or tour of Dubai, four days, five days. No. no. A grand tour Not of the beaches. Yeah. Watch this space. Yeah. Watch this space. In Italy, we have a lot. Mm -hmm. Why not? Okay. <laughs> Why not? Just round the, go around the edge one year. What Exactly. Well, don't go not? inland. Daniel, you yes. spoke to Fabian Cancellara yeah. at the end of the race. What happened to him? Well, he, was, he just seemed te almost terrorised, shell-shocked by the experience of riding today. Um, just said it was incredibly dangerous, the most dangerous race he'd ever done. And he said the only way that you would have been able to get round satisfactorily today would have been with sta a children's bike with stabilisers. Um, mm. he, he seemed to think that he was... He had decent legs today. He was fairly satisfied with his performance, but he said he was just fit, he was just happy to finish without having um, crashed and badly injured himself. Why did the expected Spartacus attack never materialise? Good question. I mean, like I say, he was fairly happy with his form. I, one thing I didn't investigate um, at the finish, and this is something that um, probably very few people have picked up on in their coverage, is different teams use different types of tyre. And this, uh, you know, you've heard, we've heard riders in the last three or four years talk about how important it is to get the choice of tyres right. This is maybe a discussion that we're more accustomed to hearing in Formula One. But um, certainly I remember when Mark Cavendish won the World Championship in 2011, there was a lot of debate in the British team about what kind of tyres he was going to use and what would be the safest tyres to use if it should rain. And I don't know if... Any of you heard anything about that today? Didn't hear anything about tyres. Do you know anything about tyres, Chiro? No, not especially. <laughs> no, you're not interested. Next really topic. No, you're not interested in bikes. Are you interested in bikes? Or you know, are you into the athlete? Not so much. It's about the athlete, isn't it? A little bit more, not extremely, but yeah. yeah. Do you speak to anyone else after the race today, apart from Nibali? No, only with Italians. Yeah. Italian guys, because I was involved to realize uh, mm. some articles about the Italian national team. So I spoke only. I, I spoke a little bit to Valverde after the press conference while he was coming back to the bus, and he said that uh, he was not able to go with Rui with Costa, Rui Costa, Rui Costa, yeah. Costa in the final because uh, he uh, uh, he hadn't legs to do mm. that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. I don't believe. 
No. No. I mean, they, the they, of they, were, they were teammates, think. obviously, Rui Costa and Valverde. Yes. They are teammates t at the moment. Till now, till uh, the end of Rui the season. Rui Costa will yeah. move at the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, just on a, from a practical point of view, <coughs> in terms of the bonuses, now Rui Costa will have got a bonus from Movistar yeah. for winning the World Championships. Not all of the national federations put up a bonus. The Italians certainly do, yeah. and it's quite substantial. The British federation don't put up a no. bonus. I would be surprised if the Portuguese federation had put up a bonus. Um, so, you know, if, if in um, Rui Costa's Movistar contract it said 100,000, I mean, it, is of the, it tends to be of the order, the contracts that I've known mm. about, of hundreds of thousands of pounds for winning the World Championship. And so, I'll not really get the benefit of that Movistar, obviously. No, so. no, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility that Rui Costa um, will be sharing out that bonus among other riders. Really? What, like who, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> this brings us on to a very a moment of great intrigue at the, in, the, in, the, in the final kilometre when Rui Costa bridged up to um, Joaquim Rodriguez. Rodriguez turned around and spoke to him. What was said at that point? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? It's very <laughs> difficult to say. No, I mean, Rodriguez told that uh, it was a kind of way, uh, a kind of mind game. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, yes. I, I met her for some instance. Cool. Uh, what, how did that mind game go? Kind of, I'll give you 200,000 euros. <laughs> was it that kind of mind game or was it more? <laughs> I mean... Are you suggesting that Rodriguez was trying to buy the race? Yeah. In that case, it doesn't or, seem to be very Or successful. Valverde sold the, the race to Rui Costa. <laughs> you think... <laughs> It's only, uh, this is speculation. Speculation. Absolutely. Poor speculation. Poor Poor speculation. speculation. Uninformed. And not more. Uninformed speculation. And, uh, hey, but this is why we love the World Championships. It's why we love, yeah, and why yeah, we love yeah. especially our retro World Championships yeah, like today. It was full of intrigue. And also the reason uh, for that, I love this podcast. Yeah. But <laughs> if I can say, uh, one last, if I can, yeah. if I can, I remember the song by News. <laughs> yeah. The title was Time is Running Out. Mm -hmm. and the problem is that my time is running out. Your time is running out. You grabbed my wrist there to look yeah. at my watch. I'm not sure if you could tell the time. Yeah. Chiro, you have to go. I am, I have when, are we, go. when are we going to see you next, Chiro? With the podcast? Yeah. You might come to the, the Cycling Writers' Dinner. You should be a, an, in, in, in December. An invitee an tonight. It's not easy. You also, um, we're going to get you to, to leave a regular message for the podcast on the phone. We're going to phone you and get you to, to leave a message. This is certainly possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For sure. That, that would be good, eh? That would be not have, good, you, you, great. You must have missed this connection that you have with our listeners. I hope that for the listeners it's the same. For me, it's a great conversation. It's definitely reciprocal. When I announced last week that you were returning to the podcast, it was huge excitement. Uh, Richard, how can I explain you? It's something that I miss. <laughs> it what? is, really? Yeah. I mean, after it's almost the like a religious France, experience for you. Exactly, exactly. You understand what I mean? After the Tour de France, all the month of August, for example, without the podcast, well, yeah, and almost all the month of September, for, for me it has been a problem. It has been a problem. <laughs> bereft. Yeah. Depressed. Yeah. Even or? when if you've been we, on the beach, you've been thinking about it. If we can organize a kind of message mm -hmm. by phone, I, can, Perfect. Fo I Perfect. can phone, I mean, uh, to England also to stay at the telephone for yeah. 20 minutes. Uh, Final question about, about Nibali, Giro. Yeah. Um, will he be invited back to write a column for Gazetta or was that dependent on him becoming world champion today? Uh, no, no, no. For the moment, uh, he won't be invited. Can I ask you a very quick final question uh, about the Vuelta? Because Gazetta gave a lot of coverage to the, the Vuelta. Obviously, Nibali was, was battling with Chris Horner. We talked about that a lot on our podcast. Yeah. Um, what, was the, what was the kind of feeling in Italy about Chris Horner's win in the Vuelta? I mean, a feeling of surprise, for sure. I think that at the beginning of the Vuelta, it was a clear underdog. Not more, I mean, not more. Surprise, I mean, mm -hmm. I think uh, is the word that describes better the feeling that in Italy... There was a bit of analysis of power data and so on in, in Gazetta, wasn't there? Yes, but power data is not my cup of tea. No. I prefer not to answer tires, because I'm not... Not tires or no, power data. Not bikes, no tires, no, no. no power data. We said data. to the athletes, I think we're on the same page Beach is there, not Chiro. bikes. Beach is not bikes. Beach is not bikes. Right, Chiro, thank you very much for joining us again. We, See you, you soon. You need to say a, a good... Peddler de Charm. Oh yeah, Peddler de Charm. Yeah, can you can you in, in person introduce Peddler de Charm? 
and now the peddler de charme. Uh, what does it mean exactly? <laughs> oh, come on, Chiro. You, this is your award. Uh, an award to <laughs> the, the, the most stylish writer of the day. Okay. Ah, the most. Yes, for sure. Say it now. And now the peddler de charme. And now the peddler de charme. <laughs> Chiro, before you go, who is your peddler de charme for today? Polito Rodriguez. Okay. okay, well done. Thanks, Chiro. Thanks, Good luck Chiro. with your articles. Ciao, ciao, ciao. 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 See you soon. Daniel, who's your Can we hear him? Jogging. <laughs> jogging. He's in a tracksuit. Yeah. Um, what, who was your peddler uh, de charme? Uh, possibly Rui Costa. Um, very obvious. But he, what impressed me most about him is his ability to kind of snuff out the right moment, the right move. He did it twice in the Tour de France. Very impressive. And he looks fairly good on a bike, doesn't he? And I just, I'm in love with his name, Rui Costa, because uh, I used to be a fanatical supporter of the footballer Rui Costa who for years was the best player and the favourite the fans favourite at Fiorentina the Florence club yeah I think that features prominently in all our stories about <laughs> today um, yeah I'll go for Vincenzo Vincenzo Nibali very unoriginal well, um, yeah but you she, know I she think she kind of steals our fun Nibali Ni- Nibali was the man of the match for me yeah. in the race we do today. find it very difficult to live up to the, the high standards that Chiro set he's a hard, like he's a hard, hard, hard act to follow but what we can do in the absence of Chiro is talk a little bit about the British team yeah. Daniel um, now at the end of it I spoke to a very uh, deflated Rod Ellingworth it was actually myself and last night's podcast guest Owen Slot from the Times who chatted to Rod and uh, he gave a very honest appraisal of what happened today with uh, Wiggins and Chris Froome and, and the rest of the team what did you make of your team today? <laughs> I think they are, they're all disappointed, and they need to be disappointed. They, they certainly haven't shown, they didn't show today what they're capable of. I saw, you know, we've, we've seen much better out that that group before. So I think, you know, that was quite disappointing. Yeah. Was it just didn't have the sort of the spirit to, to, to battle in, in horrible, you know, horrible I, conditions? I, I think maybe that that simple. Yeah, they just didn't have it on the day, you know, and and um, you know, a lot of people with talking the talk beforehand but obviously didn't couldn't see it through so you know something for us to sit down and have a look at and think did, how do we take it forward you know? did you feel and I know you've only had a couple of days with them but did you feel that this the, the desire was there among them as a group I, I, th- I felt that on Friday night when they all came in yeah it was a good yeah. atmosphere and I think we, we always feel that with the guys you know when they come back together as a, as a national team so I think that was there I think even this morning on the bus they all seemed fine you know so I say I don't think there's any excuses at all. They just underperformed. Each and every single one of them underperformed today. Do you think if you've got a big superstar um, rider mm-hmm. who can carry a team and, and embody the, the, the courage of a team like Brad, who, who clearly just can't deliver on the day? I mean, yeah. that that kind of saps. You know, he, he could lead. He could have led the others, couldn't he? With, with that, presumably that was well, the, I mean, worst, I, the worst thing that have happened. Have, have your, your 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 big man like that go backwards? Uh, well, I think um, Fumi was. The leader, oh, yeah, you know, I know and, I, and I think leader, but... you know he was the one to really sort of um, lead the team. Hmm. And I think when he turns around with however many laps to go, six or seven to go, and nobody's there. I think that's that's the issue. You know, that was the moment yeah. in the bike race where we just didn't have it. And from what I could see, he just couldn't go downhill again. So you know, that was the same as what we saw in the Giro. So no, just overall, Rod. I mean, it's been we're used to lots of medals, and I suppose it's yes. been a disappointing championship overall. Yeah, I think it has. I mean, you know, I, th- I think you, you know, from a development point of view, we, we, you always have to take the, the ups and downs, you know. And I, and I think um, we 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 do we have seen some great performances on the road, like 2011. I think we led the medal mm. table, didn't mm. we? You know. Um, <clears throat> that was a year out from the games, and there was a lot of build, you know. And I think we're going through a different transition at the moment, you know. And I, and I think that's the same here for the the, the elite lads. I just think my, my thing there for the elite lads is to sort of say, you know, if we do really seriously want to win a, a hilly worlds, what does it actually take, you know? And I, I don't think they've taken it. I don't think they've totally absorbed that this week uh, in particular, which is what we can see today. I don't think they've really taken it on and thought. Yeah, what does it take? You know, they, they weren't up for it, obviously. Was it, were you surprised that um, <coughs> the Brad wasn't better today? Or, or when you yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think everybody was. You know, even I'm sure he's walking around with his head down a little bit because you know, I don't think anybody wants to perform like that. You know, so yeah, yeah, I was surprised. Yeah. Would you say? I mean, today, you know, maybe we're simplifying it. And, putting it in sort of soap opera terms but today yeah. was a day for him to show that he was a team man we were going to work for someone else all the rest of it and we didn't really see that 
Um, no, but you know, you look back in, like as an example, Copenhagen. You know, he did a fantastic job yeah. as a team. I think, you know, even on the the day one, the yellow jersey on the Champs Elysees, he rode fantastically as a team player. So I think, you know, it's in there. I, um, I think it was just circumstances today why Bradley, and I'm sure people will perhaps read into it further, but it's circumstances um, uh, 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 that he wasn't there today. I think if it had been dry, I think he would have been okay. Right. He's certainly got the form, hasn't he? You know, you can't get second in the world time trial and not have the form. Yeah, exactly. You know, that was that's clear. He's got the form. He's got the legs. Chris was disappointed. I think he looked round and, and I think his head dropped at that point. You know, I, I think the other thing for Chris is something, you know, which is I think really good. This is a this was a great opportunity for Chris because he actually hasn't ever come into the world and said I want to perform before. So this was quite different for him, and I think a new sort of. Uh, a new area for him which is good for him to look at because the world's is where it is one of the challenges is potentially the weather you know um, and Chris wasn't good in this weather today so you know and, and I think he knows that as well and that's something that he wants to to look at I'm sure you know. well, that, the thing with, with Brad and the wet and the downhills and, and yeah. the, what um, I mean the Giro is quite a few months ago now. I mean, have yeah. you worked on that with him? And did you get well, I or? mean, if, if he was in the car behind him in the time trial, you would never have thought that that could have happened today. Yeah. Could, you, know, when, you know, when you think he was behind on Cancellara coming into the technical section of the time trial, and he yeah. actually beat Cancellara in the, in the technical parts of this. So, you know, I think, you know, you would never believe that would happen. Um, so I don't know what's I don't know what's going on there. We'd have to ask him. I think. The cycling podcast with humansinvents.com. Innovation, craftsmanship, and design. So that was Rod Ellingworth, who uh, is the coach and obviously masterminded Mark Cavendish's World Championship win in 2011. Uh, and he spoke to us this week about wanting to build a, a team towards the Rio Olympics. Um, and th- th- this, they thought, might be a similar kind of course. We don't know the course of the Rio Olympics yet, but we imagine it will be hilly. And so they, a, they came into the race with a real uh, plan. You know, Cavendish and Luke Rowe uh, basically almost led the race um, right up to the finishing circuit, the first of the ten laps. Uh, but it all, fell, it all fell apart, didn't it, Daniel? As, as Rod said there, um, they did not perform. And uh, they should all be, he said they are all very disappointed in themselves, and they should be. Yeah, I mean, we only really saw two British riders, didn't we? We saw Cavendish and Rowan. Um, Froome, I think, got caught behind at least one crash, but made it back to the main peloton, but didn't really feature at all in the closing stages. And there was this huge void in the middle of the team, the kind of engine room of the team. Stannard, Steve, Steve Cummings, um, we didn't really see them. And I'm not really sure you know, that how good their form was coming into this race. Uh, some of them have certainly been racing fairly regularly, and and had been making positive noises. It is strange to see uh, a world-class race, a world championship, um, with 80 kilometres to go and not a single British rider in the, in the league group. It is um, now, yeah. When, it, when, you know, when there was a 50, 60, as this is what we're talking about, the, the retro kind of feel to today's race. It was like um, uh, stepping back in time. Yeah, I mean, without tiptoeing around the subject too much, uh, fingers will clearly be pointed at Wiggins, because... Um, he did not feature. I was standing in Florence where the race uh, came through on, on the way to the finishing circuit and Wiggins was third last man in the bunch and I, I gather he was there most of the day. Now Rod said in that interview that he felt the problem was similar to the, the Giro. He, he lost his bottle on the, in the wet and the downhills. Um, and, and it could be as simple as that but there will also inevitably be questions about his commitment mm. to a team that had Chris Froome as leader. And, and we wonder how this will play out next year as well. Yeah, although I understand they've been getting on okay this week. Um, they've been Well, they've only been together since Friday. Okay, but um, was it you, Rich, that said that? No, oh, it wasn't okay. me. Well, apparently, no, sorry, apparently they've been talking fairly amiably okay. so far this okay. week. Um, but yeah, it is. it clearly brings into focus what a problem this is for, for Team Sky next year with um, the two of them together. I'm not really sure. Have you heard any vague noises about... Um, race programs and how they hope to kind of reconcile them next year or is Wiggins going to do a different Grand Tour like he did this? Is he going to have another pop at the year? I doubt it. I can't see that. I mean, uh, he's spoken of wanting to do the Tour again and of yeah. course it starts in England so there's an incentive for him there uh, and have been committed to, to the team. Um, his track record in, in being a, you know, a team player is, is very mixed. You know, he, he's 
he was a fantastic. Uh, he, he might have won the world championship for Mark Cavendish yeah. in 2011 yeah. with that turn Absolutely. he did on the final lap in, in Copenhagen, uh, or the final more, two yeah, laps. two laps. Yeah, he, he was remarkable, and uh, he, he, you know, nobody could could even get near the but front think, while he was I think sitting the, there. The kind of in- the interesting thing about that, and that the unique thing about that race was his relationship with Cavendish was, was vital there. Yeah. And uh, you know they have had their ups and downs, Cavendish and Wiggins. But at that point, I think Wiggins had made a personal commitment to Cavendish because um, he liked him, he felt a bond with him. And if that's not there, I don't think Wiggins can. And really he might have felt him. a little bit guilty about what happened in Beijing as well, yeah, which exactly. Cavendish was annoyed about. The other time he's performed a brilliant team role was also for Cavendish uh, on the Champs Elysees 2012 yeah. when he was in the yellow jersey. But twice on the Champs Elysees he has gone missing when it's come to performing a team role. Once 2009 uh, when he was riding for Garmin at the time. Correct. Um, and David Miller talks about this in his book actually. They had a lead out train organised for Tyler Farrar. And it, it it was a bit embarrassing. And at the finish, um, Miller was pretty annoyed because because Wiggins had not been there. Mm. Uh, a year later, when Wiggins had a very disappointing tour in 2010, they had a plan. Um, and I sat in on the team meeting that day, and they had a very clear plan about wh- who was going to do what in the final five six kilometres uh, for Edvald Bostenhagen. Now, Bostenhagen probably wouldn't have beaten Cavendish that day, but. Uh, Wiggins was not was not there when he should have been there, and I'm, I bumped into Dave Brailsford on his way back to the team bus that day, and he was very unhappy at the fact that Wiggins had gone missing. So, very erratic, very mixed. Yeah. It, his head's but either they, in it or it isn't. Which is which is the same with his own performance. Yeah, but the the British team and people like Dave Brailsford, they do seem to accept that, and I accept that will always be the case with Wiggins because they, you know, in spite of having been frustrated with him on numerous occasions, they always give him another chance, don't they? They do, they do. But there is this, you know, we've talked about it before, he's, he's on a, a salary commensurate with a, a, a Grand Tour contender. Uh, yeah. If he's not going to be a Grand Tour contender again, um, maybe there'll be moves to, uh, to, to reduce the salary or change the, contra- change, you know, change the terms of the contract. Possibly. Now, Daniel, another thing yes. we're connected with, uh, we've got to talk about Jonathan Tiernan yes, Locke. Yes, the news yes. today in the Sunday Times that he has been sent a letter by the UCI uh, asking him to respond to blood irregularities um, from blood tests taken uh, last September, apparently, mm. um, connected to the balance of the passport, which he's obviously been on this year. Um, and I spoke to Brian Smith today, who was the Endura team boss last year when uh, Tiernan Locke was riding for that team. He stands by him 100%. He, he's, he had no, no, no doubts at all that he is clean, which notably Team Sky and Dave Brailsford didn't echo those, that, that kind of robust support for the rider today. Um, but he said that Tiernan Locke was very aware of rumours that he might be doping after he won Tour de Haute-Var and Tour de Mediterranean last year and that he pushed hard to be included in the biological passport and they were told no by the UCI. Um, according to Brian, Pat McQuaid really went out of his way to try and help them um, settle this. But he wasn't on the biological passport last year but clearly he had blood tests taken in September last year which have been compared to blood tests taken yeah. this year and some fluctuations have been flagged up and uh, are now being investigated. He has three weeks to respond. Um, it's very unusual, we think, for this to be leaked because generally we only hear about biological passport cases once action is being taken um, and that's not the case yet. We don't know how many times this has happened in the past. Brailsford did say today in an interview that it has happened before. He didn't say whether that was any of well, we his know riders. That, we know that Team Sky have rejected riders who they've been in talks to sign on the grounds of fluctuations that they have noticed mm-hmm. in their biological passport. And it's no, certainly no secret that they do request this data from riders and you know, they purport to be very, very diligent in analysing it. Mm. That's... I mean, that's all. I mean, if if the... the, the flu- we don't know the, the, the detail here, but if the fluctuations in... in Tiernan Locke's blood values are with the, 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 the test taken in September and this year. This, this does flag up the, the fact that Team Sky don't do internal testing, do they? I mean, so they test riders before they join the team, but they don't then put them on any kind of internal testing program once they're on the team. No, but not many teams do now, do they? That's kind of no. fallen out of no. 
out of fashion. Another interesting little snippet is that he was tested by Garmin last April mm. um, with the Viajoni team. This is something they do with all riders. They put them through quite a rigorous uh, examination. And Jonathan Vaught has declared himself absolutely happy. He was very keen to sign the Tierney Lock last year, apparently. So, um, you know, we, we give him the absolute benefit of the doubt. And, yeah, uh, I mean, obviously it looks... It, it doesn't look great. For, he's not helped by the fact that the, the fluctuations that are being talked about correspond with a period in which he was competing with some of the best riders in the world while riding for Continental, a third-tier division team. And this year... Um, he has almost across the board um, been f- pretty underwhelming, hasn't he? He has. He's had a very, very poor and disappointing season. And you know, speaking to Brian, it was tempting to think how he might have got on at Garmin, a team that perhaps um, is a better home for mavericks like him. He is a maverick. And Brian was talking about how um, when it comes to training, um, he is not somebody who likes to overtrain. He likes to go into races quite well rested. And the Sky program is very much to to train riders very very hard. And some riders do struggle with that. Um, and Tiernan Locke has really struggled with that this year, and with the role expected of him. So we'll see how that unfolds over the next few weeks. Um, we're going to get some dinner now. We're going to go and get some dinner now. Final night in Florence. Um, it's been a good World Championships, I think. Reflections, Daniel and Florence, the World Championship? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, well, we discussed with, with Chira, it's been interesting to sort of assess where Italy are at and where the cycling culture in Italy is at. I mean, to me, it, it seems like the sport in this country is, is in terminal decline. Um, I think, you know, we've seen good crowds, we've seen a lot of enthusiasm this week, but the, the, the image and the, the kind of cycling public in Italy remains an ageing one and I don't see any real groundswell of new interest among young people and that is a concern um, but they did turn, turn back the clock certainly in the elite road and to be fair in the women's road race as well yeah. it, was, it, it was and we're not talking about 50 years ago I mean 6 or 7 years ago Italy was the dominant nation in international cycling and they have been this weekend really in, in the two races which were well, the women's elite race and the men's elite race they were they controlled the, they were very aggressive from the start today and you know they had what happened to your man there Posato he did okay but he um, he, he doesn't like the rain does he because it interferes with his no, hair he said, no and he also said he panicked when Paolini and Scarpa and Nibali crashed and he was he was close to getting back onto um, the, the front group on the, the Fiesta League climb last, last time around but didn't quite make it and the bottom line is he's just not that good is he <laughs> I mean, he's, a, he's a lovely bloke he, re- he really genuinely is a nice guy Filippo Pozzo is a very entertaining very funny but he, he just ain't that good <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so it was for sentimental emotional reasons that you tipped him last night I was wondering if uh, Rui Costa was, was perhaps the only leading rider that we didn't tip last night I think I did that I'm pretty sure I did. We'll have to play it back. Yeah. There, there is evidence out there of whether you did or not. Well, I think I, I, I was talking to um, Daniel Lloyd this, this morning, a former Cervelo rider, who said it sounds like he's become a professional gambler. I mean, he's, he had about 30 Dan bets. Lloyd. He had about, I probably shouldn't say this, but he had about 30 bets on today's race. And I'm sure I, I, mentioned, I'm sure I mentioned Rui Costa in conversation with him as well, but... Well, uh, how about the, we did mention the French riders last uh, night. Yeah. They, they did have numbers up there. Uh, Vichy was still there, wasn't he? Bardet yeah, was they were there. all a bit raw. I mean, Pino was there. He seemed to crash because I saw him at the finish. and yeah. he, he was quite bloodied and ripped yeah. up. Encouraging, though, that he was there for so long, given the treacherous nature of yeah, the descent. Yeah, that's true, that's true. And um, I think they're just a little, a little bit too... Green. Green, Bardet yeah. had a good, a 272 good kilometres long. Yeah. Bardet, I spoke to at the finish, yeah. he said... He was, it was 15 kilometres too far for him, and he said that's something that he's going to have to find over the next couple of years. And but but yeah, he, he was the only guy that attacked on the penultimate lap, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah, and he's shaping up as a very a good one-day rider, actually. He's had some very good results in one-day races, although he can also climb well in the mountains and recover well in three-week tours. Right, well, Daniel, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, we're going to head back to London tomorrow yes. and meet up again with our old chum, Lionel, mm-hmm. who's been at the bike show in Birmingham. I'll speak to you back in London. Thanks, Daniel. No worries. Thanks, Rich. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. For more articles, go to humansinvent.com slash cycling. <laughs>